What's, What's happening, happening fandoms? fandoms? Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, we react to music videos and shows. Today, we're continuing with our series of breakdowns of the legend of Vox Machina from our friend Will at the Pixelists. Uh, we're checking out episode eight breakdown today to catch all those details. If you are not already a fan of the Pixelists, you need to be. They do great content. A lot of it related to Critical Role, but not all of it. So check out their channel, give them some love. Let's go ahead and dive into this now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Pixelists. I'm Will, and today we're here to talk about episode eight of The Legend of Vox Machina season two. But before we dive in, let me give the quick spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the original campaign the show's based on, aspects of this breakdown could spoil parts of the show. That being said, if we ever dive into ultra dangerous spoiler territory, I will throw up the threat level midnight symbol. If you don't want to know, just mute until that symbol leaves the screen. Alrighty, let's go. Alrighty, to start things off, we have this shot of a marketplace in Singorn, and there's a few things here. First, we have this NPC on the right played by Brandon Alman, who is an executive producer on the mm. show. And then we have this other NPC on the left, which is so distinct looking. I feel like it has to be somebody. But I've failed you guys because I could not figure out who this is. I went through a bunch of the Titmouse people that worked on the show and also some of the other producers, um, et cetera, but couldn't figure it out. So if anybody knows who this is, could let me know. But possibly maybe it's no be one. Brian um, also Foster. Scene, uh, I originally did not notice that you could see Vax ah. and the rest of Vox Machina scurrying across in the background. Uh, similar to how I didn't notice baby Vax and Vex do the same thing in that flashback a few episodes back. So maybe I'm oblivious. Nice or melons. I was distracted by those <laughs> wonderful melons. But um, in case anyone was like me and didn't see that, yeah, it's cool. You can see them skirting by in the back. Also in this opening scene, we get these two NPC guards that I think bear a striking resemblance to Matt and Laura. The <clears> yawn also <throat> sounds like Laura, but y'all let me know what you think. Next up, we get this really quick line from Garmili saying that they had to go through the city in order to avoid the Pixies because you don't want to go through Pixie territory. And this is a nice little nod to stuff that happened in the original campaign while they were here in the Feywild. They did run into the Pixies, and in fact, they ran into an entire war between yeah. Pixies and werewolves. And it was trouble. Ultimately had to choose a side on. They chose the werewolves. Um, this, <laughs> this story makes sense to get cut for the purposes of the show because it really had nothing to do with anything else going on. Um, but I did like this little allusion to it here from Garmelia. Yeah. The crew then heads to Sildor's house and a couple of things in this shot. One, just the scale. Mm -hmm. Those little dots at the bottom are people. So this place is enormous. And also it looks kind of phallic, which I think is a nice little clue that this dude is a tremendous d Next up, we have a nice little world building detail as Percy comments on the luxuriousness of the wood in Sildor's estate. It is Vermaloc Vermaloc wood, wood, which is wood that can only be found in the Vermaloc wildwoods in Jorhas, which is on the continent of Wildmount. And it is quite rare to see this wood anywhere else. So this just further goes to show how, you know, luxurious and wealthy Sildor is. Also in this scene and in this episode on the whole, we get a lot of great Vex and Percy development. In this scene in particular, though, he's trying to assuage her fears of not feeling good enough for her father, not feeling noble enough. And he kind of, you know, tells her what it really means to be noble. And a lot of this is lifted directly yeah, from definitely. the campaign. So I'll share that now. Honestly, dear, you're too happy to look like you come from my... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that. No, it's it's a sure sign of it. It's just a, an abject misery. Believe me, I can speak to it. Um, you look too much like you, and you don't look enough like something you're supposed to be. Um, if you feel the urge to deeply bullshit, I'd be happy to help you. It's not hard. No? No. It is easy to pretend you come from money. <laughs> well... Uh, you just have to be a bit of a shit and wear what everybody else is wearing. Um, does this have something to do with that city? <sighs> oh, she's actually crying on this one. It does, they it get really emotional a lot of times because they're very they're? deep into well, this. You know, everyone. <laughs> we were judged growing up at night. I don't look forward to seeing that again. Well... It 
it's not important. I'm... Oh, I, I disagree. I think, dear, I think, I think that if you're worried about them knowing whether or not you've made your money and made your fortune, I, I, I don't think that's going to be the thing to earn their respect. I think you're better off a, with the company that you keep, and B, with the fact that you're probably just better than most of them. <laughs> I've known a lot of people with money, and uh, they are definitely not worth you. Alrighty, y'all, in this scene, we get a couple of new characters introduced, <laughs> and that includes Devana, who is Sildor's wife, played by Tox Alagundaya, oh. and we have Valora, who is the twins' half-sister, played by Jayla Lavender Nicholas. Now, I'm oh, sure everyone's thought, tired of me hyping up this cast every Sam's time someone kids. new gets introduced, but they just continue to hit smash after smash yeah. on these castings. Um, and in this Valora scene in particular, she's just so cute, and she has that little stuffed animal. Uh, which she also had in the campaign. It is a stuffed owl bear, mm. and I just love the interaction between the twins and her. You know, even though they have this fractured relationship with their father, they still have the room in their heart to, you know, be yeah. completely Soft, being open and nice yeah. with their sister. And one line that didn't end up making it into the show, but was in the original campaign, was the twins actually say like, "No, you're not our half sister. You are our sister." All right. Next up, we have the conversation with Sildor, and big surprise, he's an enormous tool. He actually is even more despicable in the show than he was even in the campaign. Not to say that he was a sweetheart there by any means, but it's just laid on doubly thick. Yeah. Uh, one thing in this scene they is made him more a of a jerk. Cheeky foreshadowing with the line about Fenthris being able to wound a titan. It is so strong. But moving on from this, we have them parting ways with Sildor granting them safe passage through the city, and he hands them a scroll that you know decrees as much. Um, this moment is essentially lifted directly from the campaign, and what Percy does here in response is also the same. Exactly from the, campaign. the same. Um, and I'm going to include that clip afterwards. But there is a noticeable difference in how this plays out in the show versus the campaign. Um, in the show, you know, Percy says, you know, actually Vex is titled, you need to amend this. And Sildor's like, yeah, I'm not here to play your little royal games. Like, I'm not going to change it. Uh, good riddance, essentially. Um, and Percy, uh, you know, is kind of taken aback and Vex kind of steps in and yells at her dad for the first time that we've seen standing right. up for her friends and herself in a way, uh, but more so Percy. In the uh, in the campaign, rather, uh, Percy, you know, hits this awesome mic drop moment with those titles and it kind of shuts Sildor up and he's like, oh, I'll have it changed. Um, and this, this moment is one of the ones I was looking forward to most. It's such a hype moment from the original campaign. It really was powerful. just so happened to be during a live show. So we have a live audience kind of reacting to that moment from Percy. And it was just all around great moment of campaign one. So the fact that they kind of um, sucked the wind out of it for the show and had Sildor not even be phased by it, at first caught me off guard, but then I really understood it. I felt like, one, it was kind of subverting our own expectations for those of us that saw the original campaign on what was going to happen. Yeah, we still get the moment. But two, it kind of takes the power away from Percy shoving it to Sildor and returning it to Vex, which I think is the more potent form of, of getting that kind of retribution isn't the right word i guess but yeah that moment is better served with vex now she doesn't get it in this episode but i think they're kind of setting up that payoff for her to ultimately you know show him what's what later on this season and also later she got to show. protect him <laughs> from her father opens from the far study and you see sildor walk back in holding what looks to be a rolled up piece of paper with the seal on it he heads over and just kind of tosses it under the table that will grant you passage through the city. That will grant you a single meeting with the High Warden. That's the most my power can do at this time. 
just a belt buckle, right? We're playing pretend. Oh, it's a sealed scroll. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's a sealed scroll now. <laughs> may, I, may, may I see that really quickly? So this one is an audience. <laughs> this is uh, in the audience. Pretend. Yeah. Pretend. And pretend handing it off. Ooh, good object work. Good job. Yeah, nice. <laughs> now get in oh, the canoe. Oh, I see it. <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> right, right. They're all elves. Oh, I can't no look at them. <laughs> oh, there's a Charizard. So this grants, this grants uh, an audience for all of us, then? Mm. Yes. Um, you're going to have to amend that one name, though, just to be fair. It's Lady Vexalia. Lady? Lady Vexalia, Baroness of the Third House of Whitestone and Grand Mistress of the Grey Hunt. So, good sir, despite your relationship with her, do watch your manners. Tea spit take. My apologies, Lady Vexali. Well, you didn't know. (laughs) (laughs) Neither did she. And you could see, you could see, like, there's confused surprise, but a smile does curl across the corner of his mouth. I will make the amendment immediately. And he steps back up, takes it from Percival, and makes his way back to the Thank study. you, good sir. So good. Also, there's one other moment I wanted to touch on, and that is Valora learning some not-so-great words. <laughs> from Straight from the campaign. This moment is also directly inspired by the campaign, although it's, you know, a little bit different. Do you want me to names? take a dump somewhere? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, headphones, will. darling. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> she kind of pulls your head out and goes, Take it down. No! Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. I like him. That's, uh, it's gnomish. It's gnomish. I like him. Doesn't mean the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> did you? She's did now transfixed on Scanlan. Don't, don't tell your mother I said darling, that. Darling, he takes him. blue sparkly booze. Blue sparkle mm. foos. <laughs> Can you teach me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many blueberries. <laughs> I'm gonna ask mom if we got blueberries. Oh, shit. Yeah. She gets everyone's go. off in the kitchen. <laughs> yep. A few minutes pass and Devana comes back out holding the tea on the card and goes, Who taught my daughter to say blue sparkly poo? Whoa! <laughs> All right, next, let's check in with Team Taldore, and they have made their way to Pike's Pop Pop's house, a.k.a. Wilhand Trickfoot, yep. played by none other than Henry Winkler. What a cool guy. Yeah. I know I've said a lot of these guest appearances have been legendary, but this one by and far takes the cake for me. Yep. They got the freaking Fonz in this the show, man. Yep. Just me t- iconic. It yep. makes me so happy to know that Henry Winkler hey. is now moved in the extended critical role family. That is like my guest dream character. Exactly, uh, mine to too. Show up on like the main campaign for the D and D table. Cross my fingers that that may one day happen. Um, I also just love the scene. We get Wilhand uh, run up to Grog, and you know he's worried about him because right. of how he looks in his depleted state. And he makes the comment of, "I wish I could say I've seen you look worse, but I don't think I have." And, and he's seen him spoilers, almost dead. Mm-hmm. Watching this, but you haven't seen episode <laughs> nine yet. Um, that's saying a lot because Wilhand literally saw Grog at his absolute lowest after being beaten to an inch within his life from his uncle Kevdak. So I don't know if this was meant as a joke. I think it was, um, but I just thought that was funny. Also, I love that we get the juxtaposition of Wilhand um, to Sildor yeah. this mm-hmm. episode. Two fatherly it figures. To show, like, what an actual loving um, parental figure in your life looks like. And uh, I just, I feel like that choice was deliberate and I thought it, you know, really delivered. Alrighty, as we step into Will Hands, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on. And first of all, in this shot in the background, you can see the symbol of the Everlight, which just kind of goes oh. to show that this is where Pike I mean, catch that learned one. all of this from, yeah, okay. from her great great grandfather. 
Also, what we else? have Willhand putting together this remedy for Grog, <laughs> and it ends up being a suppository. Yeah. And I feel like this is slightly foreshadowing for um, a moment we know to be coming thanks to the trailer. Now, if oh, you yeah. don't want to know something at all that comes from the trailer <clears throat> for the next 10 seconds. Um, but we know <laughs> that Scanlan and Vax are going to go in the back door against one of these dragons <laughs> later. Yep. So I just nice. I liked that little bit of yep. nice setup. Um, also the, uh, funny detail here is that when Scanlan is delivering this suppository, he is whistling and the song he is whistling is beads of love from, <laughs> from season, season one. one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was nice touch. One final bit I wanted to touch on here was that after Grog is given the suppository and he wakes back up, but his muscles are still not back. Wilhelm says that he requires some sort of catalyst and specifically uses the word jolt to maybe get his body to reawaken and i think jolt could be a bit of potential foreshadowing since we know the titan stone knuckles seem to be electric electric lightning jolt type damage so maybe that comes into play with him getting back his kind of already heading back to team feywild we get another great percy and vex conversation which i already touched on that so i won't retread but one thing I did want to point out in this scene was the arrowhead that he gifts her. Um, in the original campaign, Percy tinkered with all sorts yeah. of gadgets and trinkets, and he often made items for Vex, including different types of arrows. I believe the one we're seeing here is a grappling hook arrow. I could be wrong, but it seems to at least look like one, and he did, in fact, make her such an arrow in the original campaign. He certainly used it for something else. Uh, so that's... 18. 18, okay. Uh, with that bit of inspiration going in your little Scanlan bass soundtrack, you managed to figure out uh, that some, some of the gears were sticking. You recut them out, insert it, and like butter, it sticks out and retracts. Cool. Uh, so you have one grappling arrow completed. For material costs, it came to about 100 gold. All right, so from here we head into the Sondor encounter for Fenthris. Uh, but before they make their way in the tree, there is this moment where Vex is kind of succumbing to his trance-like suggestion and she walks across the water to the tree while everyone else is getting stuck in the muck yeah now clearly this is something sondor is doing and is not something vex is doing but i thought it was worth pointing out that one of the things rangers can do in DD is water walk so i thought that was fun now we go inside and we actually meet sondor for the first time and once again we have an amazing casting this time it is sindil ramamurthy um from heroes fame really wish they would have made more than one season of that show um <laughs> anyway i also think that this um model here looks a lot like matt yeah so I know, like kind of does that's what i to thought this too in pc and maybe i'm crazy and it doesn't look like matt but y'all let me know in the comments it looks like him for but sure the design the model how he is getting around by being puppeted by these um tree branches is so cool this is uh what happened in the campaign as well but it was so cool to see it like fully fleshed out and animated and this entire encounter was bonkers already so there are a number of things i want to touch on in this encounter but first and foremost we have this moment where sondor is trying to manipulate vex via the relationship with her father and vex says if i could pull the blood from my veins and give it back i would in reference to sildor um, now, she says this in the campaign, but it's in a different moment altogether. She says this actually directly to her father. Um, so I'm really glad they included the line in the show. It's a great yeah, line. Yeah, it is a very uh, good but line. But I do understand why they kind of changed it to be in this scene instead of directly to her dad. Uh, because similar to the um, Percy scene with the titles that we talked about earlier, I feel like they are changing the timeline and the trajectory a bit so that Vex is going to have this payoff moment with her dad later yes next season time but while you too may have undergone much ridicule in your youth i saved you from the brunt of it you headphones dear (laughs) (laughs) you fucked some random woman in a city you passed through and you expect us to feel sorry for you should have left us to you be with our mother away when she died. For nothing. Why? Why pull us away from her if you had no love? We would have been happy with her. 
because I had hope <laughs> that you would be worth more, given that you had my blood in your veins, than to waste away in some small hovel. If I could pull my... the blood of you from my veins and give it back, I would. I want no part of you. Alrighty, next up we have yet another iconic Vex yeah. line where she dismisses Sondor and, and kind of breaks out. Do you out think they go back? Um, it's all him improv too. To someone else. And I think it's abundantly clear who she's referring to, but if you haven't picked up on it and you don't want to know, mute and also don't look at the screen for the next 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> but clearly she is talking about Percy. And in the very next shot, we get the isolated picture of him. Uh, so very subtle. Uh, not that they're even trying to be, but also in last episode's breakdown, I briefly touched on this, but during her acid trip, when she looked at Percy, you know, she yes, saw the hearts. Yeah, hearts on so Percy. I'm really glad that they included this. Uh, not that I ever thought they wouldn't, um, but iconic moment. And I will share the one from the original campaign as well. Is there trust in you? Is a form steps forward once more, his head tilted, looking at you curiously. You want to be loved? I wish a bond, a companion more. Would you embrace me? I swear that this version of this encounter is mm -hmm. so much creepier than than the one in the show. Oh yeah. Um just the way Matt describes just it just becomes these evil people mm -hmm. and his voices and his facial facial expressions. He's just so masterful. I mean, look at look at Sam here. He's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like the evil. He's like eating it up. Yeah. If, if he had popcorn, he'd be like ah. ah. <laughs> yeah, it's just I'm I'm getting my skin is crawling mm. watching this original version of it. I mean, the one in the show is pretty darn creepy, right? But this is way Much more it's creepy. way way kept worse. It PG thirteen. Yeah. It's just, and, and look at Mauritius' face. She's like, oh, that's my husband saying that stuff. <laughs> Embrace your rebirth. I could give you so much. Thanks, honey. I will give you the means to protect them. Your home? What would you ask in return? Heart. My heart is someone else's. And I pull my bow. He withdraws a moment. <laughs> the tendrils whip out again and connect into his back. And he's pulled aloft back further in. All right, next up, let's talk a little bit more about the encounter <clears throat> itself. It was awesome. I'm not going to wax too poetic on it, but just seeing this fully animated, it, it was better than I even imagined it was during the original campaign. They really did it justice. But specifically, I want to call out a few of the things we see Finthris do. Um, one, when he first starts shooting it, it is making all of these vines explode from the ground and yeah. potentially, you know, try to to trap her in them. Uh, this is an ability that Fenthris actually had. It was called Bramble Shot. Mm -hmm. So it was cool to kind of see that on full display. They had a bunch of other abilities that, we though. We see him notch flaming arrows and electric arrows. Mm -hmm. Now in the original campaign, it did have the capability of doing electric damage, um, but not fire damage, at least not Fenthris itself. Like I've mentioned before, Vex does have a blazing bowstring. Um, so I'm curious to see in the show if they are changing it to be able to do multiple forms of elemental damage or if that is just something that, you know, Sondor has. Really, we're going to have to wait and see what it can do in Vex's hands because it may be the exact same or it could be different and there may even be more things than Sondor even, you know, exhibited. Um, yeah. But in any case, 
Amazing. Alrighty, while Sondor and Vex are having their tango, we have Vax, Percy, and Keyleth dealing with these treant creatures. And Keyleth is the MVP here, where she goes into her fire elemental form once again, which the music oh, oh, is yeah. so good. Um, and she absolutely destroys these treants, which I guess something Durant that you may not is his favorite on, in, not NBA player. NBA or just I guess it so. All happening so quickly is she actually uses her tree stride ability, which is you know how she travels through trees to these treants to like run through them as her fire mental form and just <laughs> go from one to the other, the yeah, out, which was so epic. And this actually happened in the campaign. Uh, Marisha had this idea and executed it, and I was so glad that they actually displayed this in the show. It was very cool also, imagery. Also, it instantly dies. The rule. Well, That's yeah. just what it you says. notice as you tear into its body using the tree stride to kind of open it up, it looks down confused as you pull into it and then just begin pummeling and scraping the inside of its form. As you do so, from the inside, what little bit of kind of fire retardant like, uh, you know, black liquid was somewhat dried or coated on these, not as thick as it was in Sondor. Um, not only has it caught fire, but the wood here is very, very ready for kindling. And it's vulnerable to fire. Everything in that was doubled. So you just like tear. <laughs> <laughs> just watches this tree and it has a flaming elemental in its stomach, just like bursting forth and gouts of fire. Just... <laughs> it begins to crack up the center and parts of it are now bursting into flames and burning in the top. Holy crap. It's having a bad day right now. Keyleth. Serious. And then your turn? <laughs> that I am satisfied with. <laughs> All right. And in Keyleth. Alrighty, so now let's get back to the oh, man. between Vex and Sondor. But quick point of order before we do is that in the original campaign, it wasn't just Vax, Vex, Keyleth, and Percy that were here. Everybody was there. All of Vox Machina was present. Now, if you recall, that's because I've mentioned earlier that when they teleported to the Feywild and Grog, Scanlan, and Pike got separated, that never happened in the original campaign. Everyone went to the Feywild. Yeah. So, during this encounter with Sondor, uh, Grog is actually the one to get the killing blow. But clearly he's not here, so they had to change this. Um, and I love the change, honestly, because this entire storyline and this entire encounter revolves around Vex. So it really just makes sense that she's the one to have this moment. Yeah. All right. Now, all that being said, she on to the actual moment itself. Uh, I love this. She kind of sneaks the arrowhead down to her palm and then strikes him with it. And obviously there's the poetic justice element of this being the fact that this item that Percy made, the one that really has her heart, is the one to deal him in, yep. in the heart. Um, that's just chef's kiss. But in addition to that, the way she slides the arrowhead to her palm is very sneaky. It's very roguelike, very sleight of hand. So I'd like to imagine that she learned this maneuver from her brother, Vax, who is a rogue. Yep. But in the original campaign, Vex is a ranger, so she wouldn't have those abilities, you'd be saying. But it goes deeper because she actually does. Um, in the campaign, she multi-classes and takes levels in rogue as well as ranger. And yep. at this point in the campaign, when they are fighting Sondor, she had done that. So she may literally be using rogue abilities that she learned from her brother in order to kill Sondor yeah, here. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe is even getting sneak attack damage on this final blow. Uh, so I just thought these were details that were all really nice. All right, so after the combat, we get this one final scene with Garmili, who teleports Vox Machina, or rather opens a portal for them to get back to Taldore. Once they've left, he kind of reveals that there is more to him than meets the eye, and he takes on this new form. All right, from here on out, we're entering threat level midnight territory uh, <laughs> for campaign one and campaign two. So if you aren't comfortable with those spoilers, we'll see you when that symbol disappears. So what he's about to talk about is massive, massive, massive spoilers for campaign two, which is going to actually be a, an animated show on mm. Amazon. Do you oh, want to hear this? That's fine. Yeah. You you're okay with that cuz it's going to it's going to spoil some amazing things. But all right, here we go. Okay. So, our tagging, we get to see him. I'm, I was so excited and I, the iconic look, the iconic colors, the hair. Uh, it's just good to see Artie and I love I love 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 that Matt is voicing him. Don't get me wrong, loved Billy Boyd, thought he was an amazing Garmili, 
But Artagan is such a big character, especially in Campaign 2, that I'm really glad Matt's keeping him for himself. Um, so just a couple interesting details here for those of you that have seen both campaigns. Obviously, Artagan is the traveler. We got the hints from the notebook in the previous episode mm-hmm. with the gate on the front. But what's interesting here is, yes, he's teleported Vox Machina to Taldore, but one of the um, main story points in campaign one and campaign two by default is that he is looking for a way to get to the prime material plane himself so he can open a portal why doesn't he just walk on through either they're changing that dynamic for the show which i don't think they are since they had a gate on his notebook but more likely it's just because he can still open portals um since he is a very powerful archway, but he himself yeah, can just cross go through. through it to get to uh, Taldore. So one thing that I hope, hopefully is going to come up at some point in this show, maybe not this season, probably not this season is our is going to ask them to craft him this gate, which he will then use in campaign two. Um, so all just very exciting, especially with the announcement that a mighty nine show is in the works. Um, just that is really very, very excited exciting. To see him here. When is that coming uh, out? Looking we don't know when it's coming. All righty, y'all. And then to end the episode, we are back with Team Taldore. And one little detail here in Wilhand's hut is these axes on the back wall. Now, if you haven't seen episode nine yet, slight spoilers. Um, but these are the same axes that Grog used to use in the past um, before mm. he met Wilhand. So cool that they are still around, I guess, just in case. Um, but in this scene, we get them figuring out that, hey, we need to go to Western and get this vestige. And Grog lets them know that, yeah, I know who has it. It's my uncle. And he killed me with them. Now, I mentioned Grog's backstory a bit in a previous breakdown. And I'm probably going to retread some of this as it's becoming relevant again. But I will probably do that in episode nine's breakdown as it makes a little bit more sense to do it then. And y'all, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, oh, actually, I have one more thing to mention but i'm going to give my outro spiel first um so anyone that made it this far in the video i really appreciate it uh you know i (laughs) I, i'm getting tired of saying this i know you guys are getting tired of hearing it but the likes the comments the shares it really means so much i can't even tell you how much more algorithm like love we've had recently um and it's all thanks to you guys so i really appreciate it um you're killing it and this these videos take a long time and are a lot of work but it's so worth it because you guys are having such a great response to this and you've given me so many nice comments they don't go unread so i really appreciate it uh let's get uh, how many times i've said really appreciate it counter going i'm not actually going to do that because that would take me long i'm not a good (laughs) video editor um, apparently you anyway, did do it <laughs> uh, what, I lost my train of thought but I'm we're gonna chug on through uh, he's more Pixel into really podcast. I'm more of through the thank podcast, you part um, covering all the nerdy things we enjoy but what's relevant to you watching this video is we cover critical role campaign three so if you're watching critical role campaign three definitely check it out we deep dive theory craft and discuss each episode and we do that every single week can't remember if I said that or not it's getting late Um, so yeah, would appreciate it if you check that out. Uh, (laughs) We're also talking about the last of us. So if you're watching that season, uh, keep an eye out for our episode on that as well. And I also, no, I think that's it. But the Easter egg I forgot, Garmili mentions his distaste of the theater. Oh yes. This is a character trait lifted directly from the campaign. My man just does not enjoy the theater. So I'm going to leave you with that tonight, and I will see you guys soon. And three, avoid the theater. I love the theater. Oh, that's good advice, theater. actually. <laughs> avoid the theater. Just Wait, in is general, this, the is... theater? Just in general. I Musicals? hate all theater. Let's avoid the theater, please. <laughs> I'll do an inside check on this. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know what I have in here. Probably not bad. Terrible. 13. 13. I mean, he seems pretty perturbed by the idea of theater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm changing my mind critic, on this guy. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Will, for all the hard work you do. It is intensely labor-intensive yeah. 
to to get all these details and put these videos together and we really appreciate you giving us permission to to review them with our with our subscribers and uh it really does bring out a lot of the details um mm -hmm. i like the the little details out of wilhand's hut yeah and also the 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 detail about the vermilock wood mm -hmm. from from uh do you have anything specific out mm -hmm. of this one? The the middle episodes of the three that they release each week are generally the low key ones. Mm -hmm. And episode eight was a middle episode, so that makes sense. Well, um, I guess we'll we'll leave it there. One one more chance to for you to go check out the Pixelists. If you've gotten this far in the video, you like their stuff, obviously. So go give them a subscription or. A, Push the subscribe button, give them some love, and uh, we really appreciate you guys. Thank you, and we'll see, see you in the, the next, next video. video.